everyone. Welcome to this WA session. I'm Nikki Jovakik from Lookup Strata and also the Managing Director of Tower Body Corporate, a body corporate management company in Queensland. I'm your host for today's session. Shane White is back with us today to guide us through reading your strata plan. We'll be talking about the different types of strata plans and what makes them different, the basic features of the strata plan and where to look for them, restrictions of use, boundaries, common property and maintenance. Learn why it's crucial to seek clarification if you're uncertain about any aspect of your plan. Discover the importance of gathering comprehensive information before signing any sales contract. This session is for WA Strata managers and lot owners and other industry professionals, and it is based on the WA legislation. So for this session, the information is not really applicable for other states. Now, before we begin, as always, I'd like to mention that the information in this session, including discussions arising from submitted questions, questions and chat conversations is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as legal advice and you should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in this session. We welcome back Shane White, Director of Strata Titles Consult. Shane previously worked at Landgate as an Assistant Registrar of Titles. He was involved with document examination and the Strata advice line through the previous changes to the Strata Title Act during both the 1996 and 1997 amendments. And Shane has spent time delivering training to the property industry, Landgate staff, and has been a part-time lecturer at TAFE. Having previously lived in and owned a two-bedroom unit for 27 years, he can relate to strata problems that occur from time to time. And for the past 11 years, Shane has been a strata consultant, providing education, problem solving and training on strata related matters. Shane has assisted our WA readers with questions to their strata queries over the years, and he has joined us for a few webinars, which we're always grateful for. So thanks again for joining us, Shane, especially for this topic. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Nikki's given a great intro into uh, what this is going to be about today. So we're starting off at a very uh, basic level of uh, interpreting uh, information on a strata plan. It's a little bit complicated, and I just want to put you through this little exercise. If you saw a, an advert for a property and you're interested in it, and it says it's one of a duplex pair, so two units, very scenic views from an elevated position. This multi-level unit has many features, particularly the handcrafted spiral wooden staircase and own sun deck made from locally grown timber. Beautiful greenery forms part of your private living area. It uh, conjures up uh, you know, being out there with the, the, the bath uh, gown on and having a bit of a, a martini before uh, you know, adjourning for the, the, the night. Um, I just wonder what you think that description would lead you to believe. And it's quite funny when uh, you see the result. So here we go. Um, well, I can't hear the, the rounds of applause or laughter, but I can imagine that you weren't thinking it was going to look something like that. Um, that's why it's important to understand and interpret what's written on the strata plan. Um, what you think it means and what it actually does mean. Uh, there are certain legal connotations and uh, definitions of some of the words in the Act, and it's important that you are able to distinguish uh, what these are. So the current legislation is still called the Strata Titles Act 1985, which was amended on the 1st of May uh, 2020, or oh, that was when it was uh, proclaimed and also the Strata Titles General Regulations of 2019. These are the two governing um, statutes um, that we have the, the regulations. And uh, here's my old copy of the old 1985 Act. Uh, I have a number of them. Uh, I have a copy of the 1966 Act as well. It's not very big. It's about a uh, quarter of an inch thick, if that. So. We'll move on. There are different types of strata plans and they're not all the same. Uh, you've got big ones and small ones, sure, but you've got high rise and low level, uh, but they're all, they've are all they got different purposes, commercial, residential, just to name a couple, but you can get mixed residential and commercial, uh, which is becoming quite common now. Uh, industrial stratas, 
you can have stratas that are made up from uh, land areas where they have individual lots created for agricultural, agricultural, silviculture and viticulture. So we have agricultural uh, areas for certain crops, silviculture, which is the growing of trees, and viticulture, which is uh, the vine uh, industry, the, the wine industry with uh, vines. So you can have a whole strip of vines that could be a lot, and that's on a, a you know strata plan. Uh, short short stay accommodation, um, and I probably haven't named all of them, but they're not all the same. They all got different boundary definitions, so that gives you an idea of the vast types of uses that strata schemes can be put to. There are different types of strata plans. So I mentioned earlier the 1966 Act, which was the precursor to what we are now with the 1985 Act. So pre-85 and post-85. In 1996, they created the ability to have survey strata plans. And all of these strata plans have got different boundary uh, definitions. So pre-1985 strata plans, the ones that were created from the 1966 Strata Titles Act are still in existence, but have had legislative changes applied to them um, over the years. So with a pre-85 strata, the lots are shown as squares. And in this screen shot, uh, we have one, two, and three. Now, one important thing to uh, tell you about this particular strata is that all the land around the outside of the building is common property because it doesn't have a lot number on it. And the surveyor at the time, being a good bloke, thought he would uh, be generous to give exclusive use of carports. Unfortunately, any strata plan that has this type of endorsement on it, uh, this endorsement's not valid because there's three reasons. One, the surveyor was not an owner in the strata scheme. Two, there was never a general meeting approving a bylaw for exclusive use. And three, there was no bylaw registered on the strata plan. So the carports are all common property unless they're backed up with a bylaw that's since been registered allocating exclusive use of the carports or for that matter, any other area of common property that forms a courtyard. So that was one important uh, distinction with the, the pre-85 stratas. They still exist, um, but they have had boundary changes uh, through the legislation. This is a post-85 strata. So the strata, the 1985 Act created the ability to have part lot land ownership. So we can see uh, that part lot three is the building and part lot three outside is the land area. And together they form a total square meter area, which is what you own. Now, on a strata plan, the common property area here is the driveway, which I've indicated in blue. Uh, it doesn't bear a lot number and all three owners have an equal, well, have a share in the common property ownership based on their unit entitlement values. So this clearly outlines what is owned by a lot owner and what is common property. Um, the boundaries between the, the two lots, so lot two and lot three, uh, you have the Dividing Fences Act, which also encompasses the <clears throat> allocation of who's responsible for the ownership of the fence and the repair of it. So the fence between lot two and three is 50-50 between those lot owners. But if it was a fence between lot three and the uh, unit or the ownership out the back, which is lot 62 on another plan, uh, that's 50-50 between those adjoining owners. At the front of lot one, Lot one, where it faces the street, East Dean Circle, 
for all lot one, if there's a fence there, then lot one has to maintain it themselves. It's not shared between the strata company because it's not common property. And the adjoining ownership is the road reserve, which um, the uh, state government is not going to go hard with you in your fence. So you're, unfortunately, you're up for the whole cost of the fence if there's one out the street front. On the carport, on the uh, common property driveway side, uh, the uh, adjoining ownership would be common property and the adjoining owner, which if you have a look on the, the location plan is lot 12. So if the, the stretch of land being the common property driveway uh, along lot 12 would be 50% of lot 12 and 50% a strata company by all three owners. Uh, the rear fence down the side of lot 12 to lot three, uh, that's between lot three and, and lot 12. So that gives you an indication on just, of course you might have bylaws that specify something different. So that gives you an idea of how complicated it can be. And that's just on this particular strata plan. This particular plan is what's known as a survey strata plan. As you can see, it's got lot one and lot two, but it also has lot three, which is identified by CP3, meaning common property. And that stretches from the boundary of lot two to Alice Street. Now, the CP3 area is jointly owned uh, by lot one and lot two. It would be an access area for carting the bins from lot two to the street front at Alice Street. Uh, it's 1.5 metres wide and it has some dotted lines on it. And there's a little circle with the letters 14 or, or figures 14 H. This identification mark identifies the dotted line as an intrusion easement. Now, under the previous strata titles general regulations, the regulations were identified by uh, regulation 14, and there were different letters which identified different types of easements. This particular easement, when you look at the, another part of the strata plan, it will identify 14H as an intrusion easement for eaves and gutters. But there could be other easements for intrusion for footings, uh, air conditioners, and you can have light and air, pedestrian access, party wall easements, uh, vehicle access easement, pedestrian easement. And they'd be identified with a different letter under Regulation 14. So we still have the strata lots, lots one and lot two. At the back of lot two, we have a right of way uh, and there was a special notation here of lot 300 that has ROW underneath it and a little line identifying a, a sliver of land which is on this strata plan temporarily because that will be uh, resumed or the current word is taken uh, for the widening of the right of way so that it can be gazetted as a public right of way. Um, at the moment, it says it's colored brown on this old plan and it would have been a private right of way for the uh, night carts. Um, so now, these types of right-of-ways are commonly converted to a public right-of-way with a street name, and your rates would uh, contribute to the uh, asphalting of that uh, right-of-way for everyone to use. I'll just move on. Uh, yeah, the terminology. Uh, I'm sorry if I've used some of it already, uh, but the terminology can be confusing but it has specific meanings which are identified in the Strata Titles Act itself under section three, which is at the very beginning of the act. And it lists particular words that will have specific meanings as determined by the act. Uh, we have boundaries, we have a location plan. So the location plan will show the outline of the strata scheme, the footprint of the buildings, 
and the location of any streets and adjoining lots either side or at the back. We have another page, which is a floor plan, which identifies each lot and what the part lot numbers are and square metre area of your part lot and your building. So we have lots and part lots. We have the unit entitlement page, which identifies uh, what proportion or share of the common property you own. It also determines your proportion of vote if your vote goes to based on the unit entitlement value and uh, your voting rights. Yeah, so your voting rights and your proportion of levies that you pay. Uh, the only way that can change is if a bylaw has been implemented to uh, have a different uh, method of uh, calculating the levies. The strata plan uh, is sort of like a title, but there's no duplicate issued. You can get a copy of it, but it has an encumbrance panel at the back. Uh, the old ones specifically had encumbrances written on it. And we have bylaws and management statements, and these can be found listed on the back in the encumbrance panel at the back of the strata. So bylaws and management statements, uh, management statements contain a, a predetermined set of bylaws that are created uh, by the developer and they are enacted on registration of the strata plan. So you have a full customized set of bylaws in the management statement, which may include all sorts of things like stage subdivisions, uh, exclusive use bylaws, uh, different methods of levying, just to name a few. Today, the Act now splits the bylaws up into governance being Schedule 1 and conduct bylaws being Schedule 2. Strata boundaries, they're not all the same. So I've said we had a floor plan and a location plan. The floor plan shows uh, where all the lots are and after 1985, the surveyors could write in a boundary definition relative to the lots being the buildings and the part lots being the land outside. And the new uh, 85 stratas had height and depth limits, whereas previously, pre-85, the 1966 Act stratas did not have any height and depth because they didn't own any land outside the building. So the strata boundaries will determine who's responsible for maintaining what part of the building and where the common property is. Over the years, the boundaries have changed. The 1966 Act, when it first came out, the boundaries were halfway through the walls and halfway through the floor and the ceiling. And then when the 1985 Act came out, the boundaries automatically changed to the inner surfaces of the floor, walls and ceiling as shown in the little boxes on the left of 1966 and 1985. The 1985 Act also allowed for the supplier to have different wording uh, using a different section of the Act that could extend the boundaries to the external surface of the walls, the upper surface of the floor and the under surface of the ceiling. So the first two drawings would indicate that the buildings are all common property, but the internal cubic airspace being your lot is bounded to the internal surfaces of the floor, walls and ceiling. Whereas in the post 85 example, the boundaries could extend to the external surface of the walls, meaning the walls are yours, are yours to uh, maintain, but the slab is common property and from the ceiling up is common property. And in 1996, 97, the amendments to the 85 Act allowed for section 3AB to be created and the boundaries could be to the external surface of the, of the walls down the ceiling. So you own everything and all the attachments. So that's where I say it gets complicated. There's no uh, wording, that there are different wording that defines the boundary and that would largely depend on how the surveyor was feeling on the day and how he chose to write up the boundary definition or what the developer was trying to achieve and how the surveyor was able to express that 
in what part of the buildings was owned by an owner and what was part of common property. So there is no one size fits all. There's no absolute wording that applies to them all. Uh, for the small lot schemes, two to five lot, that were created before the 1st of January 1998, automatic merger may apply. So this would mean that anything that was shown as a 1966 or 1985 strata scheme uh, or post 85 that was a two to five lot scheme, uh, ground level, or it could have its own first floor, uh, the boundaries automatically merged to the external surfaces. So if it was a six lot scheme, it would still remain the same boundaries. Of course, then people could object to having automatic merger. So the, the time to object was six months after the uh, 20th, yeah, 20th of July, 1997. And if you failed to lodge your um, objection, then the boundaries automatically changed. So the land component or part lot might have height and depth limits. It hasn't come out too uh, dark on here, but there's a light blue arrow uh, indicating a height from the ground floor, the upper surface of the floor of the part lot building, up to a certain height in meters and below in a certain, a certain depth in meters. I haven't put the, the figure in there because the strata plans are different. They can have different height and depth limits. If you have the part lot land area outside and the height limit is 10 metres, if your tree grows above 10 metres, then it's in the common property. Uh, so there might be bylaws that indicate you have to maintain your, your garden, sh tree, shrubs and bushes. Um, uh, yes, this is a, an example of a boundary definition and Welcome to my world. This is not a hard one to describe because uh, it's saying that the boundaries of the lots which are buildings, and then you get to the, the section number and it says 3AB. Automatically, it means the boundaries of the buildings are the external surfaces, and that will include anything that's attached to it. So there's a whole variety of things that can be attached to the outside of a building, apart from gutters and uh, downpipes antennas, foxtel dishes, hot water systems, solar panels, roof awnings, ornaments, um, any awnings on the outside, hot water systems. If they're attached to the building, then, then you own it. Uh, where you have a joining wall, the center plane of the wall is the boundary. And it also goes on to explain that there is a, uh, Strata excluding the balcony part lots extends. So they're talking about the dirt outside the building goes five metres below and 10 metres above the upper surface of the ground floor. Uh, all the dimensions, if there are shown on the strata plan on this one, are the, taken from the outside face of the wall. Uh, one of my most challenging strata plans that I had to try and write a report on and explain. Uh, You've seen some of the strata plans already on the, on the screen and they show a diagram and there'll be a lot of blank space around the outside of the drawing. But one of these strata plans I had, there was no blank space around the outside of the drawings of the building and the lot boundaries. It was all text. It went from the top of the page across from top to bottom, entirely covered with definitions of Carports marked A and carports marked B, and we had carports marked C and D, and then we had uh, different blocks of buildings that had different boundaries to another block of buildings. Um, it took me ages to work out how to explain it and draw it to uh, write a report on who owned what. So this one was quite easy. Uh, Section three AB, they own everything. So on your strata plan, uh, your, your first page you usually have is uh, the location plan. But we have this identity um, column, part of the strata plan, and it will have the strata plan number 
uh, it will have the plan of the previous lot tenure, which is lot 210 on a deposited plan, and the previous title number, the local government area, which is the town of Cambridge, an index plan, which is a larger plan that uh, is used to identify large subdivision areas, uh, field book information, if there was one, the scale, and then we have the name of the scheme. And this is 15 Caddy Avenue, West Leaderville. We have the address of the parcel and we have the management statement indication, whether it's yes or no. Uh, there is a dot and a no circle. So there is uh, the standard bylaws apply. Now, very important to note that unless there is these boxes are completed here, what we have is the date the strata plan was lodged, when it was certified correct, and then it was placed in order for dealings. It could be subject to certain specific things happening that uh, an easement might have had to have been surrendered or, or removed completely. Uh, certain other encumbrances may have had to have been removed or an inclusion of another piece of land. And subject to the, all those conditions, once that happened, documents would be lodged and the registrar or an assistant registrar of titles would sign the bottom of the, of the you know, the little rubber stamp would be put on there in the date. So that would be the registration date for the strata plan. And that also provides the anniversary date for your uh, general meetings. Uh, this particular strata plan had access from a reserve, a, a crown, uh, a piece of land owned by the crown. It was a, a laneway to get access to lot three. And we had vehicle access and pedestrian access because this was part of lot three, a uh, lot two. So there's all sorts of things on the strata plan that uh, there'll be another page that identifies what all these little circles with the letters in them would uh, actually mean. You'd have a little legend. So the floor plan shows what you own. So this may be shown as a lot or a part lot the total square metre area of ownership, the boundary definition as to whether or not you own to the inner surface of the floor, walls and ceiling or the external surface of the walls or you own to the external surfaces of the building. Newer strata plans may have height and depth limits. Strata plans show buildings. Survey strata plans only show the lot boundary because theoretically you own down uh, to the core of the earth and up into the into the heavens, but practically you are limited by any uh, depth limit specified in your uh, the original title for that subdivision of land and any planning guidelines for the height of buildings. So that's why it's quite often you see planes flying overhead. Uh, they're not trespassing. Also, uh, restriction of use. Now the previous version of the 85 Act did specify under section six and six A in particular about over 55 strata schemes. The new act has removed the over 55 part of it and is now expressed as restrictions, which can be varied in many and require planning approval. So here's our floor plan. Uh, here down the bottom, the text at the bottom of the uh, strata plan has the boundary definition. And we move across to the diagrams. We have the square meter areas of the lots. Um, and above that, we have enlargements, which identify the pedestrian access easements and vehicle access easements. So the part on the left, the enlargement on the left at the top, the circle marked A and the circle marked B indicate a different pedestrian access easement applicable to different lots for lot three and lot two to go over lot one. And enlargement Y uh, to the right has a vehicle access easement uh, identified by a circle with a C in it for vehicle access to lot two. Um, so they can drive over part of lot one. It wouldn't be the example I would have chosen to put in uh, the Landgate manual because it was it's too complicated, but 
it does give you an example of some of the things that would you know, appear on a strata plane. Combined location plans and floor plans, you'll only see this where there's a small lot scheme and the surveyor can actually fit the location plan, which is the diagram on the left, and the floor plan, which is the di diagram on the right. Very critical that it has a north point and the roads are marked, uh, the scale. So we have a lot of information all on one page for this particular example. It, uh, the name of the scheme is 25 East Dean Circle, Nolamara. And we have the uh, common property driveway. On the floor plan page, you see that it's not shown because it's common property, but it is included in the boundary, the perimeter of the boundary on the location plan which is on the left. So the ground floor plan uh, shows enlargement A uh, is not to scale, but enlargement A identifies a boundary between uh, for lot two and three at the top of the or at the top of the common property driveway near lot three. And we have the boundary definition, uh, which is just limited to three short uh, paragraphs. And we have the interest and not notifications panel, which is the definition of certain other markings which are on this particular strata plan. Uh, the subject in the interest and notifications panel down the bottom of the page, subject has a circle with an A in it. Now, its purpose is a mineral reservation. The statutory reference is the Public Works Act uh, section 15 and the land burdened is lots one, two and common property. So on our lo uh, location plan, we can see the little circle with an A on it. Now, lot three at the top hasn't got this distinction on it because the old subdivisions that happened years ago uh, this has turned out to be a combination of one title and another, and one title had a mineral reservation and the other one didn't. And that's where the boundary stopped. So lots one and two have this mineral reservation, uh, which is benefit to the uh, crown, so that any precious metals, minerals, gems, phosphatic sub substances, oils, etc., anything of value, is um, statutorily kept by the Crown. Um, if you find a sinkhole in your backyard uh, or a cave, uh, the state owns that as well. That only happens down at Margaret River, some of the land areas down there. Okay, unit entitlement. So section 14, which is now the incorrect section of the Act, um, <laughs> I'll have to look that one up. Uh, it used to be section 14. I didn't update that part in the slide, but I think it's 30 something, 30, 30 something. And just bear with me while I scoot through my act. Yeah, 37. So at section 37 in the new act, and this determines your voting rights at general meetings, the undivided share of common property that you own, and the proportion of strata levies payable. So the unit entitlement values may be equal or unequal, and there's a distinct difference with capital value and unimproved value. So if you bought into a strata scheme that only had one building with a, a one lot showing a building, and there was a three lot scheme. So the other two lots would have been created as vacant lots. Now, subsequent to the creation of the strata plan, uh, the two vacant lots have been built on. So when the unit entitlement value was created at registration, the building with the lot with the building on it would have been valued more because it has an improvement. But the other two lots being vacant, 
would uh, be less because there was only the land and no capital improvement. So lot one's got this massive uh, unit entitlement value of say 60 with 2020 to the other lots out of a total uh, aggregate value of 100. And since registration, there's now two buildings that have gone up, increasing the capital value of the lots. Uh, lot one still paying 60 and the other two units are 2020. So the unit entitlement would then be said to be unfair and the strata plan should be upgraded with a re-subdivision to show the new buildings on the two vacant lots. So we have a capital value and that's what the unit entitlements are based on and an unimproved value. With survey strata plans, the UE is based on the unimproved value. The buildings are not taken into consideration. So the square metre area of the lot will determine what your UE value is. And that's one distinct difference between a building strata, a strata plan, and a survey strata plan. Here's an example of unit entitlements uh, based on the capital improved value, total aggregate value of 100, as you can see down the bottom. It's not um, unusual to see some of the larger strata schemes that have a couple hundred lots that the aggregate value could be out of 100,000. And each unit has uh, a value of unit entitlement allocated to it. And the title numbers would also be allocated to uh, indicate what uh, title um, each lot has. Encumbrances. So these encumbrances appear at the back of the strata plan, the back page, and they can contain information regarding the use of the land within the scheme. It could be uh, an endorsement uh, under section 70A of the Transfer of Land Act, which has factors affecting the use and enjoyment of the land. If it's low undulating, uh, undulating land, it could some areas of it could be subject to inundation, flooding, or mosquitoes. Uh, there could be aircraft noise or unloading of ships container noise if you're down there Fremantle in the port area and maybe subject to smells from the uh, sheep carriers. Um, dog kennels, uh, barking noises, you know, maybe heard within, you know, like a two kilometre radius from the kennel. So there are all types of things that are put on uh, that's only a, a factor affecting the use of the land. There are, could be other, other information such as easements indicating that some other ownership has the right to use a driveway to get to their strata scheme or their, their house. Um, any notices uh, or, uh, that may be issued on the strata company uh, and other encumbrances such as caveats, memorials, uh, property seizure sale orders, uh, the recording of a management statement, uh, any changes to the bylaws since the management statement was lodged. And now since the changes of the uh, Act happened in 2020, there is a requirement. If you make any changes, alterations or repeal any bylaws, then you need to do a consolidation of bylaws. And that means that if you've had a very active strata scheme and every year they have a general meeting and someone comes up with a new bylaw and they want cats are out, and then the next year uh, cats are in. And after a while you end up with about 10, 15 different changes of bylaws. You would have had to have got a copy of every bylaw document to ascertain what the current bylaws were. The consolidation of bylaws, one of the good things is that that consolidation document has the whole consolidated set from the first to the last bylaw that was recorded, all put into one document. So the consolidation document is the last document and that will be the current set of bylaws and that's all you need to get a copy of. Unless there was another change of bylaws after that, then that document would need to contain the full set. So it means you're only up for the expense of one document instead of 10 or 15. 
there may be other information contained in the encumbrance panel, which could be an order from the State Administrative Tribunal uh, where there's been a dispute and uh, SATA had to make an order which changes something on the strata plan or the scheme, the scheme notice, using the new terminology just to confuse everyone. So here's an example of a encumbrance panel and there's a notification of the Town Planning and Development Act uh, that could contain different types of building restrictions. Uh, factors affecting the within land, as I said before, the, uh, you know, could be mosquitoes, midges, port noise, aircraft noise, dog kennels, uh, inundation, and we have a management statement. Uh, so these all have a distinct alphanumeric number and that, docu that number identifies that particular document and they can be separately ordered through Landgate uh, bylaws and management statements. So what am I allowed to do? How should I conduct myself? And all strata plans are regulated by bylaws. There's no strata plan in existence that doesn't have any bylaws. Um, there may have been no changes made, but by the uh, Act of Parliament, there's a standard set of bylaws and that's what you've got. So they're now called conduct bylaws and uh, governance bylaws. Um, so they can be changed. One regulates the governance of the strata scheme and the, the schedule twos, the conduct, regulate how you should conduct yourself and what as an owner you need to do. So how should I conduct myself? Well, treat everybody else with respect. That's for starters. Restrictions. So they've since uh, been called something different. And it's, they now come under the new act under restrictions, uh, now section 21. And some of the other restrictions on the existing strata scheme still have over 55 uh, restrictions. Short stay accommodation, uh, there could be a restriction of height or depth, uh, particular use of the lot, so not to be used as a commercial facility, uh, or you know, building restriction. So I have examples of some of those. We'll just go through those. In this example, it's a use restriction uh, under the old section six. And it's in accordance with the Metropolitan Water Sewage Supply and Drainage Act. And you can't build or develop over the area indicated, which is the portion mark A. So we look at the C enlargement B and we have the perimeter of the parcel. Um, and that was a laneway for this particular strata scheme. There was a, a right of way at the back and you were not allowed to build over the um, area marked A because that's where the sewage is, so the sewage pipes were. So you may own to the limit of the boundary, um, but you can't build over that portion marked A, which would be um, further defined in the enlargement so B on that particular strata plan. Building restrictions. In this particular instance, uh, we have lot one and it has part of lot one and part of lot one. Both parts, uh, the sum of the total being 229 metres squared. And we have lot two. There are no parts of lot two the whole boundary shown there is lot two. That is what's known as a vacant lot, uh, as I was referring to previously. And it says the line of the east face of the wall is the boundary. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a north point on this drawing. So this restriction is limited to uh, the building of over lot two uh, as a single bedroom dwelling. So the particular local council uh, put these restrictions on for people that wanted to have a granny flat uh, built out the back and look after their uh, their uh, grandmother or grandfather. Or, uh, so single bedroom dwelling or kick their, kick their daughter out of the house or their children. <laughs> Here you go, you can make as much noise as you want out the back. 
go for it. Um, age restriction. Uh, primarily uh, the standard wording that was in the old act. Uh, have attained the age of 55, uh, retired from full-time employment and is deemed to be include a person who is or was the spouse of such a person. So I imagine there's a lot of uh, uh, young brides that have had old fellows marry them and uh, passed on. Uh, they would be eligible to be uh, still a resident in this strata stream. And short stay. Some areas, local councils, are uh, very popular in Dunsborough, Bustleton area, that the restricted use notation includes that the building is to be used for short stay at holiday accommodation. And no person shall occupy any short stay holiday accommodation unit for more than three months in any 12 month period or for any residential purposes. So you can't stay there um, and be a resident. It's a holiday uh, accommodation only. Um, some of the strata schemes like this may have um, exemptions for one particular lot being the caretaker, the caretaker lot or management or the office. So that's a short stay example. That was really great. I mean, what you've shown us is how complicated startup plans are. <laughs> and uh, we do get many questions on them, obviously, and people look at them and they're just confused about what's going on. And uh, you've shed a little bit of light, but I think in lots of instances, it might be best to involve uh, someone like yourself to, <laughs> to have a look at a strata plan. But that was really great. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for that. Um, I guess I had a couple of questions. And one of the thing was um, in New South Wales, I know they have a common property memorandum that lists all of the common property for a building. Is that applicable? Could you do something like that in WA? And if, if so, why hasn't it been done? That's a Landgate question. <laughs> oh, is it okay? But what, what, do, do you have an opinion on that at all? Or? Uh, look, the, the thing is that the boundaries uh, identified by the surveyor will say uh, what the boundary is for the building, you know, the part lots. And what's not part of a lot will be common property. Uh, unless there is uh, some other identifying feature on the strata plan, there's no um, set definition that is written or notation that's put on the strata plan that says this, these items are common property. So a lot will depend from um, the balconies of the boundaries um, and where the boundaries start and finish. And if it's outside the boundary of a the lot, then it will be common property. Um, balcony uh, balustrading, for instance, if it's within the boundary of the balcony and, the, and the, the boundary definition says that the balcony extends from the external surface of the building wall. So you've just come out of your door onto the balcony and extends to the external surface or the concrete edge of the slab of the balcony. And if your balustrading is within that space, then you own it. If the balustrading is outside the edge of the slab, then it's common property. So there's all sorts of things like that that uh, come up. Okay, fair enough. And we had a question that came in um, and that it's kind of related to that as well. So we might just read that out. And the question is, can strata boundaries be changed with a bylaw? We want to give exclusive use to common ground areas to adjoining lots, but they're not sure if this needs to be done by amending, amending the strata plan or whether we can prepare a bylaw. That's four ground floor villas in a strata. So you can uh, create a bylaw that grants exclusive use. It's still common property, but you have the exclusive use of it. There was one strata scheme that a real estate agent said, oh, look, I'm not sure about this particular strata plan, but they say they own the back lot, but the, the boundary uh, it hasn't been identified with a part lot. And I said, yeah, you're right. And looking at Google aerial view, uh, they've got a, a common property spa pool in there. He says, but it's not common property. It's, it's in their backyard. I said, yeah, but it's not a part lot. It's common property and they don't have exclusive use. It's on the common property. Therefore, it is a common property spa pool. Uh, if people want to jump the fence and pop in, <laughs> take your own risk. Um, 
the um, those things can best be identified, best be uh, fixed by doing a bylaw for exclusive use, or a more permanent uh, thing would be to have a resubdivision done to um, allocate the areas to ownership and um, that would allow them to uh, have permanent ownership of the land areas subject to any conditions of what they should and shouldn't do in the backyard um, that might cause embarrassment to the strata scheme. Um, alterations to, you know, making alterations within the boundary of a part lot just because you own it doesn't mean to say you can do anything you want in it. If you build a pergola, that's a structural alteration. Having said that, if you install an air conditioner, that's also a structural alteration. You have to look at it the other way around, that it's an alteration to the structure. Um, whereas if you looked at it as an engineer, they would say, well, a beam and a pillar are structural items. Well, they are, but in the course of uh, the Strata Titles Act, you have to view it differently and uh, you have to make an application in accordance with the Act under Section 87. Okay, and then further to that, what are the bylaws that you would recommend strata companies register to make the boundaries as clear and as efficient to manage and maintain by all parties, strata company and strata managers? I did mention about dividing fences earlier on in the presentation and exclusive use bylaws don't generally cover fences. So you might want to have a bylaw in there that identifies the use of the fences, who's got to split the costs. Uh, and I mean, I could, I could you know, write, do up a drawing that will identify who the, the, the responsibilities, whether it's 50-50 or 100%, uh, or you know, this is a whole common property, but if you have a bylaw, it's in black and white, and that identifies exactly. Um, people are expected to read all the um, information that they're handed as a purchaser and not just say, oh, this is too hard. I'm putting it in the bin. I'll put it in my too hard basket file and leave it there and not look at it. It's important that when you buy into a strata that you look at the documentation provided. And if you don't understand it, then get someone who does and write up some sort of report uh, about what you're going to be limited um, to or buy. And um, if it says that uh, you know, you've know you got to do such and such or whatever, uh, you might not want to do that. And you've got, to, you, you've got to understand these things before you buy into it, not buy into it and then say, I didn't know that. No one ever told me about that. Well, the agents are bound to hand over all this information, the strata plan, a copy of the AGM minutes, the copy of the insurance policy, the bylaws, so that you're fully informed of what you're getting into, you know, the amount of levies payable per quarter. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. And another question was, um, my strata plan notes courtyards and car bays allocated for the exclusive use of the owners of the lot numbered thereon. So is this statement sufficient to claim exclusive use for resale and just in general? Unfortunately, um, for the use of are only put on by the, the, the surveyor. So they're not valid for three reasons. The surveyor was never an owner. There was never a general meeting and there was never a bylaw registered allocating exclusive use to any lot. So in actual fact, there's still common property. The best thing you can do is get a bylaw for exclusive use or do, it was a four lot scheme. Uh, I, uh, I can't remember to tell you the truth. I think yeah. they did send the strata plan and it might've been a four lot scheme. Yeah. I mean, that's when it gets complicated. Uh, I'll explain why, because if it was created before the 1st of January 1998, then they're eligible for merger um, if they are a single tier scheme. So that means that there's not lot two is not on top of lot one, so a multi level scheme. They may have a ground floor, first floor, second floor. So it's still a single tier scheme, it's still the same lot number. Then they're eligible for merger. Uh, or they could do a resubdivision. That would uh, change the unit entitlement values. Um, any bigger, bigger buildings, you know, bigger capital improvements or larger land areas will change the unit entitlement values because if it was a, a pre-85 strata, the UE values may have been one allocated by the surveyor um, all the way down the, the, the column of a UE sheet. 
So as always with Strata, it sounds like a fairly straightforward question, but it never, ever is. <laughs> it's, it's variations on the thing. <laughs> oh, um, good to see. Uh, okay, I'm not sure whether you can answer this one. As one owner in a small LUT scheme wants to install a solar system, does Strata have any control over the location? Again, I can't answer it because mm. I haven't got a copy of the Strata plan. I don't know if all of the boundaries are owned by the lot owner. So if it's a 3AB boundary, then it would be a lot. That would be an application for a structural alteration. If the roof is common property, then it would come under section 64 being a um, sustainable infrastructure easement. So that would only require an ordinary resolution. Uh, it's not easy just to answer it. It's a simple question, but there's different ways it can go, different rabbit holes. Mm, okay, definitely. As always, you're a wealth of knowledge in this area and it's really lovely to, um, and you explain things so well and you take your time over it. So it's always great to have you in the sessions and, um, and present these, these type of sessions for our audience. So thank you so much, Shane. Lovely having you here again today and we'll catch yes, you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. If you gained value from this video, please hit like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're looking for information about parking, strata insurance, defects and more, head over to lookupstrata.com.au or sign up to our free weekly newsletter via the link in the description box below.